In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There are three parts to God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, the true and living God. All three are separate, yet all three are one. There was a beautiful angel in heaven called Lucifer, whose high position was to guard the throne of God. Then one day the sin of pride came into his heart. He wanted to be like God Almighty. Lucifer, in his madness, enticed many angels to join him in an attempt to take over heaven. But Lucifer had a big problem. He was only a created being. God threw Lucifer and all the rebellious angels out of heaven. These fallen angels became devils and Lucifer became Satan. They settled around the planet Earth, which became Satan's domain. The Earth became the focal point for an amazing drama. It was now time to bring forth one of the key players. God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and give them dominion over all the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. Created he him, male and female, created he them. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Adam was perfect and was made to live forever. But Satan was furious. His territory had been invaded by a new creation called man. Adam lived in the beautiful Garden of Eden and named all the animals that God the Son had created. Adam walked with God in harmony and the Lord gave him rule over all living things. But Satan hated Adam and wanted him dead. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. So the Lord created Eve, from one of Adam's ribs. Their life in the garden was true paradise. When Eve was alone, Satan approached her in the form of a beautiful serpent. He lied to Eve and tempted her to eat from the forbidden tree. Eve made a horrible mistake. She obeyed Satan instead of God. In an open act of disobedience, both Adam and Eve, by eating the forbidden fruit, sinned before God. They lost their innocence. Both of them died spiritually, and sin passed on to their descendants like a virus. As a result, none of us is without sin. God hates sin and will not allow it in his presence. The curse of death was upon all mankind and on the earth. The Lord cursed the ground to bring forth thorns and thistles as a result of sin. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground 
from whence he was taken. As a result, Satan took control of this world system. Man no longer had dominion over all the earth and was now a slave to the Prince of Darkness and his demonic legions. Yet God in his love promised to send a savior to undo the damage caused by Adam. Adam and Eve had many children. Two of their sons were named Cain and Abel. Cain, the firstborn, in a vicious rage, murdered his brother Abel. Mankind had already begun its downward slide. As the powers of darkness spread upon the earth, mankind became more violent. Endless wars and brutal acts of murder, rape, and torture increased. Despite the Lord's mercy, men's hearts continued to turn against God. And because they did not fear God, mankind sank to its lowest level of depravity. Even to the sacrificing of children to Satan. It was rare to find a man who loved the Lord. But there was one man, a man of faith named Abraham. He was a friend of God. The Lord blessed Abraham with a son when his wife was 90 years old. It was a miracle birth. From that line came the chosen people of God, the children of Israel. As time passed, the children of Israel became slaves of the Egyptians and suffered in hard bondage for 400 years. God heard their cries for help. He loved them and wanted them to serve Him. So He sent them a deliverer. His name was Moses. He carried God's message to the most powerful man on earth, the ruler of Egypt, mighty Pharaoh. Moses spoke for the Lord and cried out, let my people go. But Pharaoh refused. So God sent plagues against Egypt to force Pharaoh to give in. God turned all the water into blood. The fish died and the river stank. The Egyptians were frantic. They were unable to drink the water throughout all the land. Yet Pharaoh would not budge. Other plagues followed. Frogs covered the land. Their cattle died. And dust was turned into mice. The Egyptians were terrified. Yet Pharaoh's heart grew harder. Then the Lord sent the Egyptians another plague boils upon both man and beast. This was followed by another pestilence. Hail mingled with fire which fell throughout all the land and destroyed their crops. Egypt was in ruins. The last great plague would kill all the firstborn throughout the land of Egypt. Moses warned the children of Israel that they must put the blood of a lamb on their doorposts as protection from God's final curse. The Lord judged Egypt. At midnight, he passed through the land with the destroyer, killing all of the firstborn. But when the Lord saw the blood on the doorposts, he would not allow the destroyer to enter that house it was passed over. That night, dead bodies were in every Egyptian home. The nation was in hysteria. 
even Pharaoh's son was dead. Before dawn, Pharaoh ordered Moses to take the children of Israel away and go serve the Lord. So under the mighty hand of God, they left. And it came to pass, at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. Pharaoh made one last attempt to stop them. But God opened the Red Sea, allowing Moses and the children of Israel to escape. Then, the Lord destroyed Pharaoh's army by closing the sea upon them. The Lord displayed incredible miracles before the people to show His great power. God then gave his people laws, the Ten Commandments, to protect them from sin and to guide them in life. But the children of Israel rebelled. Outwardly, they served the Lord, but not in their hearts. They soon forgot about the miracles and their deliverance from the land of Egypt. As a result, God raised up kings to rule over them. But even the kings did evil in God's sight. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Then God sent his prophets to warn the people to repent of their sins and serve God. But they rebelled over and over. The people hated the prophets. And rather than repent, and serve the Lord, they murdered these men of God without mercy. Time after time, the children of Israel sinned. As a result, God allowed them to be captured and suffer in slavery. Look at us today. We are no different. The whole world is filled with liars, thieves, murderers, and fornicators. We love revenge. We are all under the curse of sin. The scriptures declare, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's see what happens to a sinner when he dies. This man thought he had everything. The scriptures said, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. 
It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. After death, his soul is immediately taken to hell to wait for God's terrible judgment. All because he rejected God's love gift of eternal life. The time is coming. It is called the great and terrible day of God's judgment. When all who died in their sins will be called to appear before the Lord Jesus Christ to be judged. The Word of God says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. When it is over, God will ask an angel to open the book of life to see if your name appears. The angel will look and say, That name does not appear, Lord. And God will say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The Bible says, And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, But God, in His great love, prepared a way for you to miss this terrible place. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves you and wants you to live with Him in heaven. And He made a way for you to go there and miss hell. And that way, is through the Promised One, the Deliverer. The Jews looked for Him as their Messiah and prayed for centuries for Him to come and save them. Around the year 760 B.C., the prophet Isaiah said to the nation of Israel, Therefore, the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Satan understood the prophecy. From that time on, every virgin in Israel was closely watched. Years later, prior to the birth of the Messiah, Israel was once again under slavery to a foreign power. This time, it was the mighty Roman Empire. Rome showed no mercy to the Jews. It was during this dark period that God's great plan of salvation began.
when Gabriel, one of the highest ranking angels in heaven, penetrated the earth's atmosphere. The powers of darkness were electrified and instantly recognized that God's timetable was now in motion. Gabriel came to the city of Nazareth to visit Mary, a virgin, to give her a message that would change the world forever. Mary was overwhelmed at the appearance of the angel. He said to her, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And Mary believed Gabriel and said, Be it unto me according to thy word. Jesus leaves the glories of heaven to begin his mission. Destination, Nazareth. The Holy Spirit overshadows Mary the Virgin, and she conceives. In her body, the creator of the universe is being transformed into a baby. Later, Mary was led to visit her older cousin, who was six months pregnant. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the babe leaped in her womb and she was filled with the Holy Ghost. Elizabeth's child would be born, John the Baptist. And Elizabeth spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Mary was engaged to Joseph, but she was now with child and Jewish law demanded death to any maiden who got pregnant before marriage. This was a major problem for Mary. Behind the scenes, Satan wanted Mary stoned to death to murder the child. But Joseph loved Mary and didn't want to make her a public example. He was afraid for her safety and planned to call off the marriage privately. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Then Joseph and Mary were married, in the city of Nazareth. Satan moved Caesar Augustus in Rome to tax the whole world. Satan did this for evil. But in so doing, he helped fulfill Bible prophecy by forcing Joseph and Mary to journey to Bethlehem, where the Bible said Jesus would be born. Bethlehem was also the place of Joseph's birth, and it was there he had to register for taxation. Mary was just about to give birth. Satan was hoping there would be an accident on that long journey, but God was in control, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. That night, shepherds were in a nearby field watching their sheep. The angel of the Lord appeared unto them and said, Fear not, 
For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. It was in a lowly stable that the creator of the universe was born. The Bible says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. This is how the Bible describes Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. According to Jewish law, Mary faithfully offered two turtle doves for his sin offering. Even though God had chosen Mary for such a high honor, Mary knew she was a sinner and understood that her child Jesus would be her Savior. In the temple was a respected man named Simeon. The Bible says, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. He took the child Jesus in his arms and said, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. At the birth of the Lord Jesus, a star appeared in the heavens, and wise men from the east, carrying gifts, followed the star. It would be a two-year journey before they reached Jerusalem. The wise men came to King Herod and asked, Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down, and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. 
Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comfortable, because they are not. Even though there was a great slaughter of the innocents, God took their precious little souls to heaven. After King Herod died, the family moved back to Nazareth, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. During the Passover, Jesus understood that one day, as the Lamb of God, he would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. This was the greatest life ever lived. At the end of the feast, instead of going home with his family, Jesus was in the great temple with the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Satan watched his enemy and heard his words. The doctors were astonished at his understanding and answers. How did young Jesus know so much about the law? It was easy. In his glory 1500 years earlier, he himself had given the laws to Moses on Mount Sinai. When Joseph and his mother found Jesus, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. Eighteen years later, John the Baptist was asked if he was a prophet. He answered them and said, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. The next day, Jesus, now thirty, came to John to be baptized. When John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God! which taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit, and was with the wild beasts, being tempted by the devil, and he did eat nothing for forty days. Despite all of Satan's efforts to make the Lord sin, he utterly failed, because Jesus is God Almighty and there is no sin in him. When the temptation ended, 
Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. As the Lord began his ministry, he preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus revealed the heart of God by saying, Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. His teaching stunned the people, and they said, Never spake a man like this man. Most of the religious leaders controlling the temple were rich hypocrites who had no mercy and had corrupted God's laws. They quickly became the enemies of the Lord Jesus. The temple of God had been turned into a money-making operation, cheating the poor and innocent. When Jesus saw it, in anger, he made a whip and drove the religious crooks out of the temple, poured out the changers' money, and overthrew their tables, and said, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Jesus was the great miracle worker. The Bible says, Behold, there came a leper, and worshipped him, saying, <coughs> oh, Lord, if thou wilt, thou, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. The Lord had compassion on the hungry multitude following him. And through his miracle power, he fed 5,000 men and their families with just two fishes and five loaves of bread. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. One night, Jesus surprised his disciples by walking on the water. He said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. All creation obeyed the Son of God. Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me Though he were dead, yet shall he live. In demonstration of his power, he came to the grave of Lazarus, who had been dead four days. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and the news spread everywhere that Jesus could even raise the dead. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. The common people admired Jesus. His biggest opposition came from religious leaders. They accused him, saying, His power came from Satan. But Jesus said to them, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. 
Behind the scenes, Satan was deeply involved. But you must realize that before the devil moves against someone, he must first get permission from God the Father in heaven. And so, to fulfill Bible prophecy, God allowed Satan to attack the Lord Jesus. Later, the Lord's religious enemies tried to trap him by asking, Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image? And superscription. They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Jesus exposed the Pharisees when he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Jesus said, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus said to the crowds, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Lord Jesus sent shockwaves throughout the religious establishment when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, thereby declaring to the whole world that he is the only way to heaven. Those words turned the religious world upside down. They hated Jesus for saying them then. And multitudes hate those words today. The Messiah's ministry was coming to a close. The prophet Daniel foretold to the exact day when the Messiah would enter Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna. But Jesus knew that within a week, they would be shouting, Crucify Him! Satan was busy moving the religious leaders to plot the death of his greatest enemy. After all, it was Jesus Christ who had thrown him and his angels out of heaven. The disciples were still excited about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, believing that he would soon be a king. But at the Passover supper, Jesus explained that he was about to shed his blood and die. Jesus took some bread and wine as a symbol of what was about to take place. He broke some bread, which represented his body, that would be broken on the cross. Then he gave them wine, which represented the blood he would shed. 
This established a custom to be followed until his second coming. After the supper, Satan made his move. He used a disciple named Judas Iscariot by entering into his body. What followed made Judas the greatest traitor of all history. Judas went to the chief priests to betray the Lord. Judas sold out to the religious crowd for 30 pieces of silver. Then Satan, believing his hour of triumph had come, summoned his dark forces to Jerusalem to destroy Jesus, the light of the world. That night, Jesus took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane and left them so he could pray alone. The Bible says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, was about to take upon himself the sins of the whole world. Jesus prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Judas gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Then came they, and laid hands on Jesus, and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, and drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priests, and smote off his ear. But Jesus touched his ear, and healed him, and told them to put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Jesus reminded them that he could pray to his Father in heaven, and he would give him more than twelve legions of angels to rescue him. That would be more than seventy-two thousand angels. But Jesus would not allow the angels to defend him, because he had to be crucified to fulfill the scriptures. And he was arrested. Satan was delighted. His arch enemy was defenseless. And the devil's moment for revenge had come. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. They asked Jesus this question, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy! What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. 
And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. This act fulfilled another prophecy. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. After hearing the charges, Pilate was politically trapped. Out of fear he looked for a way out and said Pilate to the chief priests and the people, I find no fault in this man. The Jews became enraged and turned the situation into a near riot, putting the pressure on Pilate. This was a special Jewish feast day, and Pilate knew that it was customary to release a prisoner at this time. Pilate wanted Jesus released. And the soldiers brought before the people a murderer named Barabbas. They were to choose between him and the Lord Jesus. Pilate asked the crowd to choose which should be released, Christ or Barabbas. To his surprise, they all cried out together, Not this man, but Barabbas! Barabbas! Pilate asked what he should do with the man called the King of the Jews. The crowd shouted, Crucify him! Pilate found nothing done by Jesus deserving death. He thought if he had Jesus scourged, it would please the crowd and he could release him. So Jesus was taken by the soldiers to be scourged. The Lord Jesus was in complete control of the situation. Each step of the crucifixion had been planned in heaven by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit before the earth was ever formed. They tied the Savior's hands to an overhead beam and whipped him, fulfilling the prophecy he gave his back to the smiters. Jesus had the power to stop them, but he willingly allowed them to do so. The leather whip usually had pieces of steel, balls of lead, and sharp bones attached. Not only the back was whipped, but also the buttocks and the legs. As the sharp bones and metal in the whip tore away at the flesh, muscles were sliced wide open. The arteries would be hit, spurting blood. Most victims died from the beating alone. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Remember when God cursed the earth with thorns because of sin? The soldiers made a crown of poisonous thorns and jammed it down on his head, causing terrible pain, swelling, and bleeding. Jesus was to become the sin offering for us. The crown of thorns symbolized the awfulness of sin. And they stripped him and put on him a purple robe. They put a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! 
each soldier present hit Jesus in the face with their fists without mercy and struck him on the head with the reed. They spit upon the Lamb of God, fulfilling the scriptures, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus was returned to the governor, Pontius Pilate, who boasted that he alone had the power to crucify or release Jesus. But the Lord answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Jesus had said earlier, I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews called out, saying, If you let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Satan whipped up the emotions of the crowd into total hate for Jesus. Satan believed he was in complete control. He was not. Unknowingly, Satan was a puppet playing into God's hands. He was completely oblivious that his actions were fulfilling Bible prophecy. For the last time, Pilate said, Behold your king. But the chief priest said, We have no king but Caesar. The mob kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! So when Pilate saw that he had lost control of the situation, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. God took them at their words. They have suffered ever since. Then Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified. And they took him away. His flesh is hanging in ribbons and he is ordered to carry a cross weighing over 100 pounds, 650 yards, to the place of execution, Golgotha. The rough wood gouged into his torn back. By now, he was already dehydrated. The miracle was that he was still living. Another prophecy came to pass. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Another prophecy came to pass. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheek to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. God left heaven in love and mercy to bear the insults, lies, and hatred of His creation and to die for their sins. The angels watched in horror. By now, his face was a mass of torn tissue. The thorns, which had caused such massive swelling and painful infection, were almost covered with swollen flesh that he no longer looked like a man. 
Hundreds of years before this even took place, the psalmist prophesied these words about the Lord Jesus. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Jesus himself said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And with him they crucify two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, And he was numbered with the transgressors. The soldiers gambled for the Lord's clothing. The gentle Jesus was further humiliated by being stripped naked for all the world to see. Jesus looked at his tormentors and prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The onlookers said, Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. <laughs> Himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. The horror of the crucifixion was described medically by a qualified physician who said, This was the most agonizing death a man could face. He had to support himself in order to breathe. The flaming pain caused by the spikes hitting the median nerve in the wrists explodes up his arms, into his brain, and down his spine. The spike burning through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet jerks his body erect. Then the leg muscles convulse and drive his body downward, beating him against the cross. Air is sucked in but cannot be exhaled until the buildup of carbon dioxide in the lungs and bloodstream stimulates breathing to relieve the cramps. Exhaustion, shock, dehydration, and paralysis destroy. The heart is barely able to pump the thick blood as each of his billions of cells die one at a time. Our sins sent Jesus Christ to the cross. As many were a stony to thee, his visage was so marred, more than any man, and his form, more than the sons of men. This was the turning point in all history. Never was there a day like this day. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross that terrible day was not human blood. It was God's precious blood. The only thing that could wash away our sins. Why did Jesus go through all this for you? Because He loves you.
the sky became black as God the Father could not look upon sin. Jesus took the sin of mankind upon himself, including every evil thought or deed, and paid the terrible price on the cruel cross. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, just before he died, the Lord cried out, It is finished. All the work necessary to save us was completed. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. The sacrifice on the cross will never be repeated. To make sure that he was dead, a soldier thrust a spear in the Lord's side, and out came blood and water. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly! This man was the Son of God. After his death, the body was taken down from the cross and wrapped in fine linen and placed in a borrowed tomb. Great uncertainty gripped Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus was dead. Judas had hanged himself and the disciples were hiding for fear of their lives. Everything seemed hopeless. The disciples, in unbelief, forgot that Jesus said he would rise again. Then it happened. The greatest event of all time. After three days in the tomb, the glory of God burst forth, and the crucified one rose again from the dead, offering to the world the hope The Lord Jesus, in great victory over sin, death, and hell, proclaimed, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come. The Almighty, I am He that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. At dawn, on the first day of the week, women brought spices to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. They were greeted by an angel who said, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen as he said. Go quickly and tell his disciples. Satan's kingdom was shattered. In his madness, Satan was defeated. A resurrected Christ meant Satan's days were numbered. Satan underestimated the power of God Almighty. If he had known it, he would have never crucified the Lord. The resurrected Jesus was seen by over 500 witnesses. His disciples were overjoyed. The Lord gave them this direct order. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Watch closely and see the billions upon billions who died in their sins. 
Jesus loved these people enough to leave heaven and warn them about hell and judgment. He shed his precious blood, God's blood, to wash away their sins. He died and rose from the dead. But none of these people believed him. None of them made Jesus their Lord and Savior. Instead of choosing life, they chose death. So Jesus, as God Almighty and final judge, had to send them here to their second death. In the name of God, before it's too late, before you die, Believe Jesus and make him your Lord and Savior before you end up in this horrible place. Before his return to heaven, Jesus made this wonderful promise to all those who receive him. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus proclaimed that all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Then he was taken up into the clouds to heaven. Dear viewer, this is the greatest story ever told. Jesus is indeed the light of the world. If you miss Jesus, you miss the way to heaven. He himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Although Satan is a defeated foe, God has given him permission to rule over this world system, which is totally corrupt. Satan's purpose is to blind the hearts and minds of people to the gospel. Millions are deceived. Religion is one of Satan's ways of destroying your soul. But Jesus came to save your soul. Satan has multitudes following the teachings of Buddha. But Buddha is dead. He's powerless to save, for he was only a man. Ancient pagan religions worshipped Astarte, known as the Queen of Heaven. Today, Millions of Roman Catholics unknowingly worship this same pagan goddess as the Virgin Mary. God himself commands in his holy word, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. This is an abomination in the eyes of God. One of Satan's masterpieces is Islam. History proves that Allah was nothing more than the ancient moon god of the Middle East. Muhammad was doomed to hell when he rejected Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. The devil has furnished mankind with millions of false gods to worship. In his wicked imagination, man has worshipped everything from insects to rocks, rivers, 
idols made with hands, and even Satan himself. To be a follower of Jesus, you must reject all of your false gods and follow him alone. The lake of fire is the final place for all who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior. It's too late for them. But what about you? If you receive Jesus, this is the beginning of a wonderful new life. God will bless you and change your whole life and give you a brand new heart. All of your problems won't go away, but He will carry your burdens for you. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. But the best part will come when you stand before your wonderful Savior at death, and He will say to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. God loves you and guided you here so you can be saved from a burning hell. If you want Jesus to come into your heart, you must ask Him. Repeat these words and mean them. Lord, I realize that I am a sinner and need forgiveness. I believe Christ died for me and rose from the dead. Jesus, I now repent. I am willing to turn from sin. Please, come into my heart. I trust you alone for my salvation. Thank you for letting me hear and receive the words of eternal life. In Jesus' name, Amen.